In 1982, when the Final Four came marching into New Orleans, the North Carolina fans in the record crowd of 61,000 cheered when Michael Jordan's basket lifted the Tar Heels to the NCAA championship. Five years later, the Final Four returned to the Superdome and produced a new NCAA record crowd and new heroics. Who's your hysteria? The 1987 NCAA Final Four highlight show is brought to you by Rawlings Sporting Goods Company, maker of the official ball of the 1987 NCAA Basketball Championship. The opening semifinal paired a couple of surprising survivors. The Providence Friars, who seeded sixth in the Southeast region, defeated Alabama Birmingham in the first round, went into overtime to beat Austin P two nights later, then in the regionals, eliminated the top two teams, First, Alabama, number two, and then Georgetown, seated first. And to test Providence, the Syracuse Orangemen. Seated second in the East, the Orangemen struggled in the first round against Georgia Southern, struggled again against Western Kentucky, then defeated Fired Up Florida in the regional semis, and upset the top-seeded team in the East, the North Carolina Tar Heels. Syracuse and Providence were, of course, familiar rivals. Members of the Big East Conference, the Friars, coached by Rick Pitino, had lost twice during the regular season to Jim Beheim's Orange. It is the 11th season, Jim Beheim. Providence's hopes for an upset rested on its long-range shooting. The Friars led the nation in three-point goals per game. But high scorer Billy Donovan missed five of his first six shots and the team as a whole missed 10 of its first 12. Syracuse, despite some cold shooting of its own, moved to an early lead, 10 to 6, after Howard Trish's jump shot. But when the Friars finally got their first three-pointer of the game from Darrell Wright, Syracuse's lead was cut to a single point. Then, thanks to an alley-oop pass from Sherman Douglas, Syracuse freshman Derek Coleman slammed home a basket that triggered a five-point spurt for the Orange, opening a six-point lead. But Providence stormed back to draw even at 15-15 when Donovan fed Carlton Screen, who turned a fast break into two points. The joy of the Providence fans, however, was short-lived. Syracuse was clearly superior under the board. Coleman scored from the inside for the third time. And Patino, the Providence coach, had to watch his team go cold again, missing 10 of 11 shots in a six-minute stretch. Syracuse pulled away during this spell, outscoring Providence 9-2. Freshman Steve Thompson rolled in a beautiful driving basket for the Orangemen, who never again were seriously threatened. Ronnie Cycli, the junior center, scored the last four Syracuse points of the first half, two on this dunk, and the Orangemen led by 10 at the intermission. <laughs> Providence fans still had hopes for their fires, who'd missed 10 of 11 three-point shots in the first half. But Syracuse, whose Greg Monroe led both teams in three-pointers, ran off 11 straight points early in the second half. Monroe was high scorer with 17 points for the Orange, who had all five starters in double figures. Cycli was right behind Monroe with 16 points. Syracuse's rebounding superiority was especially evident under the offensive boards. Ten offensive rebounds to only four for Providence in the second half. Syracuse had its biggest lead, 20 points, less than five minutes into the second half. Patino sought to rally his troops, and freshman reserve Carlton Screen responded with his biggest game of the season. Screen ended up with 18 points, high man in the game. While Syracuse was suffering through almost four scoreless minutes, Delray Brooks' three-pointer brought Providence back within 11 points. But despite an aggressive defense that produced 11 steals, a record for an NCAA semifinal game, and despite Screen's spectacular play, the Friars could not catch up. 
The Orangemen were simply too strong and too talented. And in the final few minutes, the Syracuse lead grew to as many as 18 points. The final margin was a still sizable 14 points. Jim Beheim led the Orangemen into the NCAA championship game for the first time in the school's outstanding sports history. Indiana University had already played in four NCAA title games. Its semifinal opponent, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, none. The running Rebels, with the best record in the country and top seeded in the West region, had won their first two tournament games easily over Idaho State and Kansas State. Then the Rebels beat Wyoming in the regional semifinal. And in the final, came from 16 points down at halftime to beat Iowa. Indiana, too, was supposed to be in the Final Four. Top seeded in the Midwest, the Hoosiers had little trouble with Fairfield. A first half struggle against Auburn, then overcame a Duke team coached by a former Indiana assistant, Mike Krzyzewski. In the final, Indiana, nine points behind LSU with only five minutes to play, rallied to earn its trip to New Orleans. Coach Bob Knight's fourth journey to the Final Four. He had finished third the first time, first the last two. UNLV reached the Final Four only once, 1977, and placed third. UNLV got off to an early lead. When Gerald Patio missed, Jarvis Bass Knight slammed home the rebound. The Rebels fans had more to cheer about a few seconds later. Indiana's second highest scorer, Darrell Thomas, clicked on a jump shot, but on the play committed his third personal foul only three minutes into the game. But Steve Isle came off the bench to replace Thomas, and Isle's tip in set off a string of seven straight points for Indiana. The Hoosiers caught up with the running Rebels after Ricky Calloway stripped the ball from Patio. Steve Alford, Indiana's All-America guard and Olympic veteran, not only directed the Hoosier offense, he starred in it. After Alford's basket five and a half minutes into the game, UNLV never again led during the first half. Indiana moved into a five-point lead when Keith Smart drove, spun, jumped, and connected. And the longtime UNLV coach Jerry Tarkanian turned to his trademark, his towel, for consolation. It didn't help. Isles' driving layup lifted Indiana's lead to seven. In the first 10 minutes, the hot-handed Hoosier sank 11 of 17 shots, 65% accuracy. Dean Garrett was Indiana's high scorer in the first half with 14 points. The Hoosiers attempted only two three-pointers in the half, and Alford made both of them, his second, helping the Hoosiers to a 14-point lead, their largest of the half. But UNLV fought back, and Freddie Banks, who made four of six three-point shots in the first half, triggered a surge of seven straight Rebel points. Eldridge Hudson, one of UNLV's most gifted prospects until knee surgery cost him a season, scored three baskets coming off the bench. Hudson's heroics excited his team's fans. His coach was less demonstrative. In the final minute of the first half, Banks clicked for the fourth time on a three-pointer. At the intermission, both teams had made more than 50% of their shots, and Indiana led by six points. UNLV had shown its fans against Iowa that it could come back, and the Rebels wasted little time in the second half. Bass Knight's alley-oop capped a 9-2 run that lifted UNLV in front by a single point, the Rebels' first lead since the early minutes of the game. When Banks hit his second straight three-pointer of the second half, his third in a row, the Rebels led by two. But that was UNLV's largest lead of the second half. And when Alford, Indiana's ace, sank a jump shot seven minutes into the second half, the Hoosiers regained the lead, 65-63. UNLV, mired in a two-for-12 shooting slump, never caught up. Alford wound up with 33 points, 
which matched his second highest scoring effort of the season to the dismay of the Rebels coach but to the delight of the Indiana cheerleaders. The Hoosiers made more than 65% of their shots in the second half. Rick Calloway made three out of four. Only the long-range bombing of Banks, who scored on 10 of 19 three-point attempts and collected 38 points, kept UNLV in contention. With less than two minutes to play, and Indiana up by seven, Banks missed. But Armin Gilliam took the rebound and scored, and the running Rebels were still alive. They drew within four points when Banks sank another three-pointer with a minute and 11 seconds to play. But then UNLV missed its next five shots, and when Steve Isle turned a driving layup into a three-point play with only 13 seconds to go, Indiana had a nine-point lead and the game in hand. The final margin was four points. A disappointment, naturally, for Tarkanian. A big victory for Knight, shooting for his third NCAA title and for Indiana's fifth. It would be his Hoosiers against the Orangemen of Syracuse in the 49th Annual National Collegiate Basketball Championship. If the two semifinal games lacked anything, it was last second dramatics and the championship game more than made up for that. The Orangemen of Syracuse and the Hoosiers of Indiana, each team with two seniors and three underclassmen in his starting lineup, each team superbly coached, each team colorfully cheered. In the first nine minutes, the lead changed hands eight times, neither team able to open up more than a three-point gap. Dean Garrett, one of two junior college transfers in Knight's starting lineup, scored an early follow-up dunk for Indiana. Garrett's show of strength was matched a few seconds later by the Syracuse co-captain, Howard Trish. After the Orangemen had missed four of their first five shots, Trish drove and dunked. Yes, yes. Twice during the first nine minutes, Syracuse leads turned into deficits when Steve Alford, the Indiana captain, connected from three-point range. But if Alford punished the Orange from the outside, Derek Coleman, the Syracuse freshman, punished Indiana on the inside, dominating the backboards. Coleman wound up with 19 rebounds in the game. Syracuse missed nine of its first 14 shots before Sherman Douglas hit on the first of only two three-pointers converted by the Orangemen in the first half. Alford fired five times from three-point range in the first half and, remarkably, scored four times. Coleman was just as remarkable underneath. A slender six-foot-nine, the freshman had 13 rebounds in the first half alone, only five fewer than the entire Indiana team. Let's go, let's go. The leading scorer for the Orangemen before the intermission was the junior center, Ronnie Sikely, who scored all four of his baskets close in. Sikely had five offensive rebounds by halftime, two more than the entire Indiana team. His alley-oop dunk gave Syracuse its biggest lead up to that point. Sikely and the Syracuse band woke up the crowd most of them. Indiana caught up at 24 all when Darrell Thomas on a layup scored two of his 12 first half points. But Syracuse quickly moved in front again. The freshman Coleman scoring on a jump shot. The Syracuse fans kept cheering as Greg Monroe's three-pointer the only one he converted in four first-half attempts, stretched the lead to five points, the largest for either team in the first half. But Indiana wouldn't fold. Alford took command and personally turned a five-point deficit into a one-point lead at halftime. Alford scored the last six points before intermission on a pair of three-point shots, the second one only two seconds before the buzzer, sending Indiana to the locker room with a 34-33 lead. 
Neither team had shot exceptionally well in the first half. Only one man, Syracuse's Trish, was in foul trouble with three. It was still clearly anyone's game. Three minutes into the second half, Indiana earned its biggest lead of the game, four points. And once again, Alford was the key man for the Hoosiers, hitting his fifth three-point goal in six attempts. But then it was Syracuse's turn to surge. A string of eight straight points was capped by Monroe's three-point jump shot, which gave the Orangemen a four-point lead and gave Bob Knight cause for concern. But there were still more than 15 minutes to play, and Alford, with his sixth three-pointer in seven attempts, interrupted the Syracuse scoring streak briefly. After Alford's basket, the Orangemen ran off seven more points, and Coleman seemed to be everywhere during the 15 to three spree. He had three block shots and one steal, which delighted every Syracuse fan, including his mother. The Orangemen hit on four straight shots at one point, including a pair of layups for reserve Derek Brower. This one, he converted into a three point play. Coach Beheim said afterward he was proud of the way his team played. He said he had never seen anyone have a better game rebounding than Derek Coleman had had against the Hoosiers. Coleman's performance was equally impressive, but considerably less pleasing to Bob Knight, whose point of view was understandably biased. Brower's second layup made Indiana fans wince with pain, and the Hoosiers' unhappiness intensified when Trish, the Syracuse co-captain, who had missed six of his first seven field goal attempts, connected on a jump shot with seven minutes gone in the second half. Syracuse could almost taste the first national basketball championship in the school's history. But the Orangemen's eight-point lead, the largest of the game, soon vanished. The pendulum swung the other way as Indiana ran off 10 straight points. Dean Garrett got a bounce and a basket that started the streak. Syracuse missed only 11 of its 26 shots in the second half. The Orangemen shot 57.7% after the intermission. But Indiana was almost equally accurate. 17 for 32 for 53%. Alford kept the Indiana scoring string going with, naturally, a three-pointer, his seventh of the game and his last. He did not score again for the next seven and a half minutes. Darrell Thomas brought the Hoosiers even at 52 with a dunk. Thomas ended up with 20 points. But the big man for Indiana in the second half was the smallest man in the starting lineup, the junior guard, Keith Smart. Smart who had scored only seven points in the first 30 minutes of play, scooped in the shot that lifted the Hoosiers to a 54-52 lead with less than 10 minutes to go. Again, Syracuse bounced back with a rally of its own. Seven points in a row. Greg Monroe's jump shot tied the score at 54. After Smart misfired, one of three shots in a row missed by Indiana, one of only three he missed in the second half, Sherman Douglas scored the next seven points for the Orangemen, two on free throws, three on a 23-foot jump shot. Then, after Garrett hit for Indiana, Douglas struck again, a driving finger roll that gave Syracuse a five-point lead with seven minutes to go. Indiana promptly countered with five straight points, three for Thomas, two on a nifty reverse layup that disheartened the Syracuse supporters in the mammoth crowd. Fittingly, as the game approached the five-minute mark, 
Derek Coleman put Syracuse in front once more. 63-61. But then Monroe, with a chance to increase the Syracuse lead, missed by a mile. Thomas took the air ball and fed Alford. With four minutes to play, Alford ended his scoring drought, his only two-point basket of the game, lifting his game-high total to 23 points, lifting Bob Knight's Hoosiers into a tie at 65. Bayheim again rallied his troops. When Alford got himself trapped in Syracuse traffic, Douglas stole the ball away, and his driving layup with just under three minutes to play put Syracuse in front by a single point, 68-67. The final two minutes belong to Smart, who scored 10 of his 21 points in the final six minutes, who scored 12 of Indiana's last 15 points. His twisting layup tied the score at seven with a minute and 21 seconds to go. Just under the one minute mark, Syracuse jumped ahead. Trish hit again for the Orangemen. To Bob Knight's dismay and to the delight of Syracuse fans. After Trish made one foul shot and missed another, leaving the gap at three points, Smart brought Indiana back to within a point. 73-72, half a minute to play. A time for cheers and for prayers. Derek Coleman, a hero for so long, missed the first foul shot in a bonus situation. Darrell Thomas took the rebound for Indiana. Obviously, the Hoosiers wanted to set up a shot for Alford, set up a shot for their marksman. But the Indiana captain, hounded by the Syracuse defense, couldn't get into the scoring picture. As the clock wound down, Smart gave the ball to Thomas, who saw no shot, and fed it back to Smart. It was up to Smart, and from the left side, under pressure, Smart connected, connected with five seconds to play. Four seconds ticked away before Syracuse could call a timeout. Four seconds for the Orangemen to agonize, and for Smart to savor a shot that he will replay in his mind for the rest of his life. A shot worth replaying. Smart was a junior college transfer who had played high school ball in Baton Rouge, not far from the Superdome, not far from his super moment. He scored 21 points in the championship game. His timing could not have been better. Syracuse spent its time out setting up a desperate play. Its only hope, a long pass quickly converted into a basket, or at least a foul. It was not to be. Appropriately, Smart, who was named the championship's most outstanding player, intercepted the desperation pass, killing Syracuse's last hope, lifting Bob Knight to his third NCAA championship, lifting the spirits of an Indiana team that had won 15 of its last 16 games, an Indiana team that set off Hoosier hysteria in the Superdome, an Indiana team that had refused to quit against a gifted and spirited opponent. The final four was history. Once again, glittering history. Hoosier Hysteria, the story of the 1987 NCAA Basketball Championship, has been brought to you by the Rawlings Sporting Goods Company, the maker of the official ball of the 1987 NCAA Basketball Championships. This has been an NCAA Productions presentation.